Our first speaker is Elena Haskins. She's a UX and product designer that's helped SaaS-centric companies design and research software and apps that make their customers and employees feel effortlessly at home. For their talk today, Dev Friendly Design, imagine web development where every interface feels like a natural extension of the user's mind. That's the power of object-oriented UX, or OOUX. Oops. Um, and in this talk, they're going to talk about how they can impact any web-based project. We're so excited to have her here. Everyone give it up for Elena. Okay, so we're going to play a game. So how many of you have ever used Google Meet before? Okay. I use Google Meet, but I kind of hate it because a lot of things feel very un unintuitive, and especially as somebody who is a product designer and a UX designer, that drives me up a wall. So we're going to play a game where we try to delete a contact. So this is, this is, these are fresh screenshots. These aren't like old. It's not like they fixed it, and I'm coming back to yell at them. So this is an old contact I had from Bumble like two years ago. Let's delete his contact. So where do we think we could go on this interface to delete Jake? Any guesses? The three dots. The three dots. OK. So first, let's, let's try that. OK, so people. Let's click people. Literally no way. Nothing. No actions. Just a name. You try to click that. You try to click his name. Nothing happens. That's kind of weird. Where else can we go? Maybe to the side. No. Calls, messages, voicemail, archive. That doesn't sound like anything helpful. And that seems like a really basic kind of task you need to be able to do. Edit. Maybe you misspelled something. Maybe they changed their number. And we can't even do that on the most basic page, which is where you're messaging the person. So the way you actually do it is you have to go to the top. You have to go to a separate app, essentially. You have to scroll down. And you have to go to contacts. And then you've got to go search the name. Then you can delete it. Where delete? At the top, right? And then modal comes up. And then you can finally delete it. That is, in my mind, a little weird. Because when I'm thinking about one type of entity, which is like, let's say, a contact, I have an expectation, like many of you probably, that all the things that are related to that one thing or object, foreshadowing, will be together in a place that makes sense. And I don't have to go on a wild goose chase just to find basic call to actions or basic details or data associated with it. So people think in objects. You know, we navigate the world thinking in objects. And you might have been told a lot of like, flow and task-oriented things. As a UX designer, everything we've been talking about has always been flows. But what if we think about that a little bit differently? How many of you have ever heard of object-oriented programming? OK, cool. Love being in a room full of devs, because everyone always knows what I'm talking about. And it, when you talk to UX people, they're like, you know, it's just like, and you're like, oh, OK. So a lot of what we're talking about is going to seem familiar, which is good. We're not, I'm not coming in here as the UX designer who's like, hey, this is how you have to do things. Hey, what if we work together using something that you already know about, and now we can add a user-friendly spin to it, so then we can make really cool things, whether there's a UX designer on the team or it's just you. The reason that I'm here talking to you today is because a lot of the time, there's not a designer on the team. And I'm not saying you aren't good at designing, but sometimes people kind of just throw stuff together because you're like, I just want to code it. And then you look at it, and you're like, that's cool, but it doesn't have to be that way. So I'm going to give you things that you can walk away with today. You can apply to your projects. You can apply to your teams and just make things a little bit more user friendly. So my name is Elena Haskins. I am a UX and product designer here based in Tulsa, and I run a UX studio called Onalay. Um, those are a few companies I worked with. I do a bunch of different. I like to specialize in software. I used to do a lot of web stuff, um, like websites. So it's a little bit of everything. So today, we're going to talk about what is object-oriented UX. We're going to do some. So if you have, like, I don't know if they, I know you didn't get the piece of paper, but if you have, like, a scratch pad on your phone or a piece of paper, do you have it? It's in the slots, so you can read it digitally. OK. And we're going to have turnouts in about five minutes. Cool. Uh, no worries. Which 
Oh, cool. Um, which channel would you say? I think, yeah, I think for the conference, there's a channel. Yep. And then we're going to see how do you apply all this to what you're currently doing. So just another thing to think about is we've been navigating the world physically, obviously forever. <laughs> Think about when you go to a grocery store, you're thinking in terms of objects. You're like, I need to buy the food. And then from there, you think about what you can do to it. Oh, I can pick it up, I can compare prices, I can check out. But you're not like, I need to go and I'm, I'm going to the store to check out. No, you're thinking in objects. Same with, you know, if you're booking a doctor's appointment, you're not like, oh, uh, I need to be analyzed or you're thinking about appointment that usually you go on and you're like, I'm, I need to find an appointment. How do I book it? How do I cancel it? How do I reschedule it? How do I tell them I'm running late? So that's just another example of like in the physical space, we're thinking about objects. That's no different than in the digital, wait, yeah, in the digital space. The only thing is when we have the digital space, it's a lot easier for things to get a little rogue because we can put our pixels wherever we want even though it might not make sense to the user. So OOUX is a philosophy for design systems, organizations, and experiences that leverages the fact that people think in objects. So we wanna make sure things are consistent and you know, just easy to understand. Okay, so we're gonna go through the four pillars of ORCA, OOUX. So objects, relationships, call to actions, and attributes. So when we think about objects, we're gonna think, what are those things in the system? What is a user gonna interact with? So those are the core elements that someone is gonna like manipulate or want to engage with in your platform. So how do we know what those objects are? Noun foraging. So the first step is just like thinking about, this is just kind of a big brainstorm. You don't have to do all of these ways, but you can kind of pick and choose by what makes sense. So the easiest one and most direct is just user uh, and stakeholder interviews. Talking to the stakeholder and be like, okay, like what do you need? And then from there, being able to pick apart, what are those objects, those nouns that they keep mentioning? Or like, what are those like repeating things? If you are working with something that already exists, use it. Like if there's already an app or the website, just scan it. And this is also a really important tool to try to just understand a new domain. A lot of us get thrown into projects that you know nothing about, but you're paid to know a lot about it. So you can use this methodology to just become kind of like a mini expert quickly because you are doing a much more extensive audit instead of just saying, hey, client, what do we need to build? But you are actually taking this step and going really deep. Um, looking at competitors. So what kind of nouns pop up for them if you look at their websites or their apps or uh, if they have YouTube videos, your company has YouTube videos, any kind of medium you can pull so you can better understand that domain. Forums where users are, so Reddit, different articles, reviews, website copy. So literally anything related to it, we can pull from. So let's say Airbnb. We can just even, this isn't even like a marketing website. This is just their platform, but we can already see there's like a stay, experience, online experience, and user. So there's some nouns that come when I look at it at first glance. This is like a, this is a description in one of the posts. And there's like a bunch of them, stay, collection, home, apartment, et cetera. Those are all a bunch of nouns that are coming up. And so I'm like, okay, there must be something to it because they're talking about it a lot. Once we have those nouns, we can now organize them and narrow them down. So we're gonna look for patterns. What's coming up a lot? Are there any syn synonyms where we can like combine things? You know, we don't, we're not trying to make more work for ourselves. The point of this is to make things easier, but more um, thorough. So, um, and then could anything fall into a filter category? So some things seem like an object, but they're not. It's actually just a descriptor. Like if you're talking about like size or like cost, that's not an object. That's just data about an object. So these, this is like my list from Airbnb. So we're gonna look for patterns, which nouns appear multiple times. So we got stay and home and host coming up a lot. Are there any synonyms? So stay could be the same thing. Uh, let's see, home and apartment and a cabin are probably just examples of maybe a stay. And this is where you can start asking the stakeholder, are these the same thing? 
you never want to just take anything at face value. And I know how much devs love asking lots of questions. So this is a really great framework to be like, yeah, I'm not, I'm really trying to understand because I noticed you were talking about a home and apartment. Are those treated the same way? Because then your, your client might say, oh, actually, you can, in, you can rent out the whole home and there's different parameters than if you were to rent out just one room in an apartment. And that actually changes the functionality. And you're like, oh, okay, that's really good to know. Could anything fall into a, a filter category used to describe another object? So we got like amenity, pool, fireplace, Wi-Fi. Those aren't, they're technically nouns and objects, but for what we're doing, probably, it's probably just noise. So there are three criteria for objects. So we have structure, purpose, and instances. Those are like kind of the three pillars. So example of structure is like for a stay. So we got like title, location, address. Like what is all the different pieces of information that you're like, oh, okay, that actually has some weight to it. It's not just some random thing just floating around in ether. Instances, are there multiple of these? If there's something that's kind of repeatable and it has that depth, it's probably an object. So like a stay, we have all these lovely castles that you can now rent for only $853 a night. So all the money you're saving at this conference, you can just put towards the castle. And then purpose. Does it actually have purpose in here? Or is it just you know clients being cool and trying to have importance and throwing in things? You're like, no, we actually need to stay. That's the bulk of our business. Perfect timing. Um, so yeah, users will interact with a stay using Airbnb. Okay, so once you have it, then you need to define it. Now this is a step that a lot of people are like, oh, why do I have to do that? We all know what a stay is. Do you? I don't think you do. Sometimes stakeholders who've been on the team for five, 10 years are gonna disagree about what stuff is. And it comes up really late and then you're like, uh, wait, what did you say? And they're like, I was talking about this and you're like, no. And it's like two people who know exactly what they're talking about, but they've been talking about completely different things the whole time. So a stay could be a transactional event or a stay could literally just be like a home. Or a stay could just be the booking period that someone's staying somewhere. So we're gonna do a mini exercise. We're not gonna do the full thing um, for the sake of time, but we're gonna imagine we are gonna create a web experience for Techlahoma. So they have their current website, but they also use like Meetup and Slack for other things. Imagine if we bring them all together. So if you have your paper or if you don't use your head, um, we're gonna take like, let's say, one minute actually instead of two minutes, so we're gonna speed round. Um, we're gonna brainstorm potential objects for the Techlahoma experience. So take a minute to think about that right now. Think about the nouns, what you know about Techlahoma. If you don't know about Techlahoma, pretend, go to their website. Okay, we're gonna move along. You can keep writing. We're gonna do like many of this through the whole process, but um, it will, because it's just a snippet, um, feel free to, you know, we can always talk about it later if you wanna like run through anything, but this is just to get your toes wet. So these are the ones that I had narrowed it down to. Just, and this is just from looking at like the homepage. Like you can get so much from a little. And so like if I walked in here and I was like, I've never even heard of Teklahoma. I've never even been to Oklahoma. I could say, oh, I actually have a lot of information about what is important to that organization and what do I need to be thinking about as a designer or a developer, someone creating products for them. So like Oklahoman, skill, member, network, user group, membership. So I'm gonna narrow it down to just member, user group, and event. I created, well, ChatGPT, 
created those definitions for me, which you can totally use. Like, use the technology to help you. But what's great about this, and this is why I love OOUX, is you can get so many questions from every step of this. So from just defining them alone, I could say, are only Oklahomans permitted to do this? And if so, how are we vetting that it's only Oklahoma people? Is who is managing that verification? Do we kick people out if they're not in Oklahoma? That's all of a sudden I got like four questions just from seeing the word Oklahoman. Um, I saw they mentioned user group. Do people have to be involved in a user group to like go to a different events? How do you join a user group? What if you have an idea for one? All these questions are coming up that eventually we're gonna have to handle. And why do we care about this? Um, we need to know what's important because we wanna understand what the user is gonna be expecting. If they're coming in, they might have the same kinds of questions. So we wanna make sure that we address it before they get to it and get confused. Okay, the next is relationships. So this, in my opinion, is one of the most important steps. If you take away Literally nothing except one thing. I want you to be thinking about the significance of relationships. So how are they all interacting? Every time we think about our objects, it, they're always in relation to someone. You were coming to a conference and they were like, what's a conference? Oh, it's a conference for Tecklehoma. Oh, there's a relationship to Tecklehoma. Oh, you're, you, know, you meet someone, you're like, oh, uh, how, what are you doing here? Oh, we went to the same event. Oh, now you have a relation to the event. Every single thing we make sense of is through the relationships of one thing to another. So like a stay and a guest and a review all have to come together in order to make something feel seamless or else we're gonna start making a lot of siloed experiences, which is unfortunately pretty common. So this is just thinking about how everything kind of comes together. You can see the host, well the, guest, the host, and the guest will book it, um, a stay, and then there's a bunch of reviews. So. We, it's important to map out all those possibilities. And this is where I feel like a lot of people kind of skim over because we don't really think about, or at least the UX people don't really think about the framework where we can think about these relationships. It's just like, oh, just think about requirements. But there's not really a way to think about requirements. It's just brainstorm in your head what you think might be necessary for this app that you don't know anything about versus thinking about what's important, what, is, what are those use cases. So we use like cardinality. So like a zero to many, that kind of structure, which you're probably all familiar with. So like a guest has zero to many stays that they have favorited. A guest has zero to many stays that they have booked. Why do we need to care about that kind of cardinality? Because we need to make sure we are accounting for in the website or the product for each of those situations. There's been so many times that, well, I've made something and then we'll come back to the board and the one of the after they code it is like, well, what about like a guest who has multiple stays? And you're like, oh, shoot. <laughs> and the business is like, yeah, multiple stays, please, yes. <laughs> and you're like, oh, we didn't think of that. And now it's, it's, it's not too late, but it's later than ideal. So I like to do a matrix. So this is make sure it's exhaustive. So we're not, we're not just thinking of the most important ones. It's because sometimes it's the little ones that fall through the cracks that are the most impactful, like a host to a host. Like I, um, I'm an Airbnb host and I have a room in my house. And so sometimes there's like connection between us and they have a community. That's something we want to think about of in terms of like the roadmap, what features are most important um, to some of these random relationships. Um, okay, so we're not gonna do this right now, but you have your paper. So the reason there's like the three squares at the top are so then you can make your own matrix and you can kind of follow along. Um, this is what I had done. So a mem I did member user group events. So for example, a member has zero to many members they're friends with. Is that it's something we even wanna have? It's best to like come up with these different kinds of relationships and then you narrow down later with the business and say, hey, is this something we want? Do we want it to be like a social thing or do we want it to be more informational? What are the goals that you actually have? Um, and these are some questions that kind of came up. So is there a max number of user groups that a member could join? Um, how, does, how do they join? Is there an approval process? Those are just more questions that keep coming up that maybe weren't there if I hadn't been like so exhaustive. Next is call to actions. So these are, you know, what are people trying to do? This is probably the most traditional thing that people jump to when they do design or even developers are just like, what do they need to accomplish? What do they need, jobs to be done, jobs to be done. That is important. Um, and so we do wanna make sure it's fitting in here. 
So Airbnb, they might want to share, save, and reserve. And I'm representing them here in, in green. So we want to identify the different users or roles, and then also recognize that sometimes objects and roles, sometimes they're the same and sometimes they're not. So for example, in Instagram, a user is both a role, but also an object, because you need to be able to manipulate a user in the system. You need to be able to go to their page, see their posts. But like maybe an aquarium website, it's just informational. They're just a role. We're not actually accounting for them. So it's important to recognize that both are possible. So these are some call to actions that I created for a stay. So for thinking about just general users, so what does a guest do and what does a host do? They might do different kinds of things and we need to account for them, but we don't want it to feel siloed, which is why we are kind of doing them side by side. Um, okay. These are the ones I did for the Tecklehoma. So we got like a member might want to send a message if we all allow that. They might you might want to create, edit, delete, invite someone, report them, hopefully not. But we want to make sure that we do have those kind of parameters set up. And then the last one is attributes. Attributes are like the data that's associated to all of those objects. So an Airbnb might have location, price, and amenities. Attributes are what we have that distinguish each instance. So every instance of a stay is going to have the same attributes, but each the data itself is going to be different. So like everyone needs to have a location, a price, amenities, but you know the little the, that castle we were looking at is going to be a lot different than if you were renting a room in Muskogee, but they all have the same kind of information. But we need to make sure you have that kind of template laid out. Um, so of there, there's two types. There's core content, so that's like very specific information that's only unique to that. You can't really sort a filter. So for example, the name. So wonderful lake view and swimming pool, uh, Colosseo in Italy. Like you're not gonna sort like alphabetical for your stays. But on the other hand, there's metadata, which maybe I'm using metadata differently than the way you think about it. Um, but that's when you can sort and filter something specifically. And the only reason that I'm separating them is because I want to be able to flag what needs to be prioritized for sorting and filtering. Because you want to make sure you're thinking about that in the beginning and not just at the end where you're like, ah, oh, because that might affect the way that you order something on a page. When you identify all the attributes, um, you can kind of like put them all together. Okay, this is what I did for the Tecklehoma example. Um, like member, we got first name, last name, phone number, and job title. And then user group and event, you can see those. So what do we do when we have our matrix? You know, this could be really exhaustive. It could be just a few things just to get your thoughts out. But I like to go up, down. You know, you can go whatever direction. And I, I use tools like Miro or just one of those like collaborative whiteboards. You can move things around. You can do this with clients. Like I do this with people who are non-technical all the time. And the hardest part is honestly teaching them how to use Miro. And so it's, people feel really excited when you can play around with things like this and you can actually start manipulating and saying, okay, this makes sense. So what do we do with this? Okay, you're like, that sounds cool, another framework, but I gotta do my job or my schoolwork. What do we do? How does this apply? So prioritization. So you take your list and you can and you can prioritize with the business and say, what, okay, we only have this much time for sprint one, sprint two, so you can use this for your roadmap. And you can say, what is the most important thing to your business? Because the client's gonna say, I want all of it. We really want to report or <laughs> invite people. And you're like, that's great, but like, th maybe that's not the most important thing. But seeing a forced prioritization is really helpful because a lot of times people are visual and they're like, oh, well, why is that at the bottom? Because you're like, because hopefully we don't have to report people or maybe we could you know, set it up some, somewhere else. But um, the most important information we need to make sure we're collecting is their name and their contact information. So like, let's make sure onboarding is really good. Um, and then what I like to do is make a little wireframe. So this is actually great for developers who, if you're in charge of design because you don't have a designer, and you're like, I don't even know where to put stuff you can just do kind of like an informational wireframe. And you can structure it this way. So usually you take the prioritization, and so whatever's the most important typically goes on top. 
So it kind of writes itself for you without, and then it's easier, you can just grab like a UI kit and it's a lot easier to plug and play. And I do that myself also. Like I, I do design, that's a big part of my job, but I'll do this to just make it quicker. And then all of a sudden, it, I know exactly what needs to go where and it takes half of the brain power away. Um, and then this is how it converts to wires. So this is from Meetup, but this is like a Techlahoma event. Um, and so this is like how this would basically translate to uh, an actual product. Um, and then other things you can do with it is I like to make functional requirements docs. So, and this is, you probably have a few more things in yours, but um, I like to do this to make it easier for my developers. And so we're also on the same page. So I write the user stories and requirements and I'll tie them to the objects on one side and I'll say like, how does this relate to all of those objects? And then I can sort and filter those requirements. You can prioritize. This is done in Notion, sometimes they use Airtable, but this is how you can kind of take that process and put it into more like documentation specs. And then asking better questions. I know I've mentioned questions a lot, but that is really the most powerful part of this is I've been able to uncover things that just hadn't occurred to me. I'm like, oh, I didn't, yeah, that's a good one. And then you feel really smart when you're going through it and all of a sudden you have 400 extra questions and now you need to think through, but you're, your product is so much stronger because of it. And also OUX is for all sizes. You, again, I'm here at a dev conference because I want you to be able to do this even if you don't have a designer in hand. None of this was visual. This is actually, it's all kind of technical. So it makes sense in terms of like information. So if you know, it's okay if you're not good at colors. I'm not good at colors either. Don't tell anyone. So. You can use this, you can do a quick and dirty thing. So sometimes you can bang something out in like 30 minutes if you're just like, I just really need to understand like member. If you're focusing on just that. And we just quickly do that by myself, in my little notebook. Or, you know, let's bring in the team and really flesh this out. Or you could even do a full sprint. Let's say you do like a week and you make your whole product in like a week because you get the framework down so specific that you could actually get so much done I think that's the direction we're heading into, and I'm definitely an advocate for that. And I do that, I try to do more of things like that with my client, um, the different clients I work with, but and I know buy-in is a little tougher, but how do we get buy-in? <laughs> so some of the few things are like, you can do a soft launch, just do it yourself. Some of these are just exercises you can do to make yourself a better advocate of the user and also a product creator, whether you are, whatever your role is, these are all things we can do. When I do it on a larger team structure, I can do it with any type of role. Um, you can even bring in like the sales people because you want to understand how they're thinking, what is the feedback they're getting from customers, what kind of things are customers the most focused on, what do they try to sell, like which features are the most important. So anyone on a team can benefit from this process and the more information you can get, you know, the better products you can make. Um, you can even just do like a lunch and learn where you're just kind of explaining, hey, I learned about this cool topic and maybe we can use parts of it. Um, you can also just demonstrate how it's working and integrating it like slowly. And also if you think about the business needs, if done right and you actually can think through different aspects, it saves you a lot of time and money of rework because all those questions that maybe were caught after development are gonna be caught earlier. And now you can think of a lot more use cases that are gonna come up. Um, and it's just, I think of it as requirements gathering on steroids, honestly, because you can get really into the weeds. So I hope this was helpful and you can take some of it with you. Um, I would love to have any feedback because it's really helpful for these kind of conversations as I'm working with people. So if you are comfortable using the QR code, I also put this here because sometimes developers don't like QR codes. Um, anyone who fills it out, you'll enter it into a raffle for like a free hour session where we can go more in the weeds to this or you know if you want me to come to your company, um, copy of this slide deck and then if we do any work together for the next three months, 50% off that. But happy to nerd out with anyone about it. Follow me on LinkedIn. I love talking about all this, so thank you. Any questions in the room? We'll come to you. Uh, 
Um, so say you're like halfway through the, working on the project and the customer comes back and is like, hey, I've got all this cool stuff I want to add. Do you have to start from scratch with the whole thing and do it all again? No. <laughs> I, we would all die. <laughs> but I've totally been there where I'm like, ah! So sometimes the way I'll use this process is I want to figure out how it connects to the current, what is existing. And this also works if you come into a, a project that has a legacy system and you're trying to transition it. Like, it's like in no actual world would you just like start from scratch. Like if we had billions of dollars, that would be awesome. So I totally hear that. So usually what I would do is kind of pick apart and use this to understand what the new requirements are. I'm like, okay, what feature did you ask for? Okay, and you know, just ask a lot of those probing questions of how do you even envision this fitting into the system? And then I can grab some existing objects of features that are already like pretty prominent and think about, okay, how are we gonna have to connect these kinds of things? What is the most feasible? Um, how can we make something where we're not starting over and we can actually just kind of add to existing code? So that's how I would approach it. Thank you. Any other questions? Hi. Hi. Um, I'll be graduating here at Atlas in December, um, and I've been really interested in becoming a technical project manager as like a goal for the next couple of years. Um, in your experience, what kind of teams are responsible for this framework and this kind of design that you would build these sprints around? Is it the senior developers, project managers, or who kind of tackles this? So this is actually a relatively new thing where it's, is what I haven't seen is like one person like, this is my job, because honestly, a lot of people don't know about this, which is why I like to talk about it, because a lot of people are like, oh, what? Oh, wait, we could do that. So I know that's not a good answer saying, oh, I don't know, but I usually am the advocate of it. So whatever team I go into, I'll talk to the developers, I'll talk to the project managers, and I'm like, oh, this is just like how I'm thinking about it, because it doesn't have to be a full, our team has to work this way, this, our company has to switch this way. It's just another like little exercise that you can use to further your contribution and then you know kind of slowly integrate and talk to the project manager and say, hey, what if we thought about it in this way and we carved out some time because it actually would save us time, it can bring more people together, it'd be less siloed. So that's how I would recommend going to it, but there's not like, most teams probably have never heard of OOUX. Yeah. Any others? Hi there. Um, did you come up with OOUX or? No. Okay. Oh, that's actually a really good question. Thank you. Um, okay, so Sophia Prater, she is like the chief evangelist of it. She's been doing it for about 10 years. What? Oh, um, and so she is the one who like trained me with everything. So I am like a certified OOUX strategist, but she has been doing it, yeah, for the past 10 years. And she is like, she's a genius. Like <laughs> you should look her up. Um, just the way she thinks about all the frameworks. She was, I guess, is a UX designer, and she kind of kept coming across this issue. And the reason she had started this was she was working for CNN during the, I think, 2012 election, and they were like, hey, you gotta do, they hadn't done mobile responsiveness at that time. And so that's like, to think about how long ago that was. And they're like, you need to, you know, approach it this way. And you have like two days, and the election is in three days, and she's like, I need to design all these things for all these breakpoints. We've never even, what are we doing? And so she actually came up with this framework on the fly. Like she's obviously perfected it since and it's always iterating. So if anyone has any ideas or any feedback about the process, like, I would love to chat about it. But Sophia Prater from rewired.com, shout out to her. Hello, uh, Henry Vandiver. Uh, is this something you can implement with very minimal UX experience? Yes. Yeah, that's a great question. You don't have to be a UX designer. You could be like a random Joe. You can even use this for non-technical things. Like people have used this for like mental health stuff. Like Sophia was talking about, she's a podcast, um, and she was talking about how she uses this um, like in like in conjunction with her therapy, so it's just an it's just exercises where you think about what is most important, how are they relating, what do I have to do to it, and what information is associated with it. So you can take this and you can do it right now. You can do it tomorrow. You 
you can get trained and know the nuances and really how to get into it when you want to be super exhausted with it. But on the baseline, everything we covered, you could do right now. All right, thank you. Uh, and we have a question from Slack. I was going to ask that yep. first. So this is from Turaj. Um, what parts of this tend to trip up devs versus designers? Hmm. I don't know if I would necessarily think of it as like, this would be easier for devs or this would be easier for designers. Like, I'm a designer, but like I, I'm much more, I think I lean more with the dev side because I like those requirements. I like the analytics side and like I'm not a visual person. So that's why I'm like, oh, I love this process. And it's, but it's very like user focused. So it's kind of like bringing dev, the way devs and UX designers, the way they think kind of together. So, but I'm, I think probably just like not just rushing through it, which is kind of a symptom of the way we all work is just, why do we have to do all this stuff? I want to just build. I have an idea. I want to both build it right now. So that's that in essence of having to take time to like go through the details is probably what would trip people up the most. But once you realize, Hey, this is going to make it a lot easier and you have to do a lot less rework. That's something that I think is easier for devs to realize it's valuable. Uh, Hello. Oh. Uh, you mentioned that you are <clears throat> a certified OOUX strategist. How do you get that certification? So if you go to OOUX.com, Sophia has two different certification processes. So there's like an intensive one where she has like all the content created out, but some you work with like a mentor and her directly to get feedback on all your work. And then um, the other one is kind of like a self-paced. So I would check that out. It's extremely thorough. And every time I like learn something, I was like, Okay, like didn't even think about it. It like kind of makes you feel dumb that none of this had come, like no one had come up with this before, like in this manner. Like it, it plays on a, different, a lot of different ways that we work and frameworks that we know. But for me, this is just has clicked in my brain the best. I think that's it. Awesome, cool. Elena, thank you so much. Everyone give it up thank one you. more time for her.